Hello everybody, E here. Welcome back to Top 5 Friday. Today I am super excited. I'm finally starting my Top 20 of all time. Uh, today we are going through numbers 20 through 16. So settle in and let's talk about these books. So jumping right into it, I ended up replacing, uh, if you watched my video on those across the river, my review for that book, I ended up replacing Twilight Eyes by Dean Koontz, but I also reorganized things and put, because Twilight Eyes was pretty far up on the list. I looked at that after my reread and I was like, no, that's either dropping way down or it's going off the list uh, completely, as I can't put, uh, even though the carnival scenes mean a lot to me, uh, they, they're they very, they're not a small part of the book, uh, but the the pieces of the carnival that really stuck with me are a small part of the book, like the smells of popcorn and the way that Dean Koontz uh, brings the carnival to life. But anyway, so at number 20, we have Those Across the River by Christopher Buhlman. Will this be here in a month from now, a week from now? Who knows? This list, list is subject to change on a whim. When I find a terrific book that stays with me, I, it'll go up on the list. That's exactly how I do my top 20. Uh, the top five have not changed in years, though. So, those across the river, uh, you can watch my review for a lengthier reason why I love it. Um, and I'm going to try and stay away from spoilers in this review if I can. Uh, with this one, I loved that I finally got a hold of a Salem's Lot with werewolves. Um, the, the book... I, I also feel, and this is the, this is the reason why it's actually on this list. The book is a complete experience. Um, there, there is no unanswered questions. I don't feel. Um, I feel that every single little thread that is brought up in the story comes together, and I am impressed. It is very, very rare in literary horror that every, even with Stephen King now, even with Stephen King, um, he's done, he's done much better. Uh, toward the uh, things like insomnia, but so, even insomnia goes on too long, I feel. Uh, answering questions is what I'm getting at. With this one is a perfect, succinct experience, well put together, and it is, it is, it is brief. It's only 350 pages, roughly, so it's your average length novel, and it still manages to be literary. It's, it's kind of it's like gen genre length but it is literary in the in its themes and its writings all that i got a leaning tower of Pisa over here because the uh top 20 and top well the the top the bottom two books uh are on the top so i can do the ascending order and they are hard covers but the uh, the other ones are paperbacks so i'm worried that it's going to fall let me try and be gentle okay next up we have at number 19 the Gargoyle by Andrew Davidson. I did a retro review of this book. My The beauty of this book, and hopefully on this list there aren't recurring themes. Each one of these books means something is special to me because, it, because of specific reasons. The last one was The Complete Experience. This one is my favorite example of stories within a story. Um, I don't consider this a mosaic novel, um, like uh, Alan Moore's Jerusalem, like Cloud Atlas, those, those type of books. This has a regular novel narrative. It does. But there are short stories sprinkled throughout that, that uh, not embolden, I'm trying to think of the word. It's early in the morning, y'all, I'm sorry. Um, it... It strengthens the overall narrative. It strengthens the story. And you can take away those stories. And the book is still a book. Just with the Marianne Engel and the main characters, you know, line. It's funny that I remember the, uh, the, the supporting character more than I remember the main character whose head we're in. Um, I don't even remember his name, but I love Marianne Engel. She's one of my favorite characters of all time. Um, but the, those stories enhance the story. I mean, it could have been quick. Did you know this one time there was a priest or a monk that did the, There was one, these Vikings, there was these Japanese uh, during that, so, so on and so forth. You, you could have done really, really quick snippets. Davidson could have done that, but he didn't. He dove all in, and I love every aspect of that. Now, people who say things like um, the I feel like the story meandered or drifted away from, from, the, uh, from the, the plot 
if you're one of those people who find yourself saying that a lot, you're probably not going to like this book because there are parts that that dive deep into other stories. And it goes completely away from the, the narrative plot, but it all comes together liter in a literary sense. So there's number 19. Number 18, I do not have a copy of this book. Um, it would be simple to acquire, but the thing is, I like the audiobook more than I like the other the, the actual reading of it. Because I can consume the audiobook in about two to three hours if I boost the speed up to either times two or times three. And um, the the book is only like six, seven hours long, something like that. And it's Animosity by James Newman. One thing that horror writers get all the time all the time we get this crap all the time is that we must be terrible people because we write about terrible things that's what james newman talks about in animosity james newman is a christian he is a super super good dude um i put those two things separately because I, i'm just giving a i'm, I'm giving a I, I don't i'm not religious at all he's a religious man he's also a super great dude those two things are not mutually exclusive um, or I think I said that wrong. <laughs> Anyways, those two things do not always come together. There are plenty of terrible Christians. There are plenty of terrible atheists, that kind of thing. But he is, he is a great individual, a great human being, and he's religious. And he writes about some super fucked up stuff. Animosity is one of those books that describes perfectly, I feel, how an, a horror author is treated by... I, I don't want to call you normies, but um, by people who do not like horror. They automatically assume that just because you write this stuff, or just because you think this stuff, that you're a terrible person. That's what this book does well, and that's why it's on the list. Um, I know I was rather brief with that one, um, but there's not much else to say about it, because I don't want to give any spoilers away for that book whatsoever. I think it's a fantastic book, and you definitely need to go try it out. My personal favorite way to... To consume it is the audiobook, though. That's important. Next up, we have number 17, which is Gone South by Robert R. McCammon. And no, Boy's Life is not on my list at all. This is my favorite Robert McCammon book. I am not a Robert McCammon fan. Rick McCammon fan. I am a Robert McCammon appreciator. I think he's written some. He's written more bad books so far that I found. Y'all calm down down there in the doobly doo. Calm down. It's okay. I can have my opinion. Um, I think he's written more bad books than he has good books. I feel the same way about Peter Straub. They have some amazing books. Peter Straub has Ghost Story and Shadowland. McCammon has Boy's Life and Gone South so far. Um, I haven't read Stinger, and I need to reread Swan Song and a couple other ones, but I'm going chronologically. You know how I do. Gone South is the characters. The characters are absolutely amazing, but specifically, because we're going to get into characters with other books, specifically because they are so fucking odd. Um, I don't want to get into any spoilers, but the uh, private investigator, the person tracking down the main character, is amazing. Um, the, the, <laughs> the, the, well, it's actually the duo. Both of them put together, it's, it's amazing. It, it blows my mind that there is so much creativity in this book and nobody, oh, I almost dropped it, and nobody ever talks about it. Uh, you you see people go you know gone south is is great whatever then that some then there's a dog pile with what about boys life boys life is great it's a terrific book it's nowhere near as good as this i'm sorry that's how i feel about it um this book wraps up beautifully there is a beautiful theme of acceptance in this story that I really attach to, but the main thing is it is the inclusion of characters that are not, as the rest of the world would see, normal. They are odd people, and I love reading books about odd people, so there's your number 17. Now, at number 16 is a book that, <laughs> that is, I think it's the most whacked out shit ever, um, and also I find it funny that I see people dissing on, like, the regulators and other odd books, um, and they end up liking this book, which is Slaughterhouse-Five by Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, this, this book, I read this book, this is one of the only books in school that, uh, that I, one of the only books that I read in school that I ended up falling in love with. Everything else felt like a chore, it felt tedious, <laughs> but 
<laughs> but Vonnegut, with this book, the satire is on point. It's e even something that, you know, 12, 13-year-old me caught on to. The Trem Flamadorians, whatever the hell you, however you pronounce it. Everything in here, the allusions to himself as a character, you know, his alter ego kind of. Everything about this book is fantastic. But the sole purpose it is on this list is because it is one of the only cases where an author has gone full bonkers batshit crazy and the book is celebrated. Uh, you have books like The Regulators which is batshit crazy and it has terrific themes and it's literary and it's fantastic. Nobody takes it seriously. Then you have this one which is just an it, it just it just blows my mind that the book is as weird as it is. It has time travel, it has space travel, it has aliens, it has all different kinds of stuff. It has a circular narrative. It has a uh, a uh, alternating timelines. It's got all different kinds of stuff. It's got history. It's got loads of stuff in it. The same thing goes for the regulators. I'm not saying that these two books are on par. I'm just saying it's odd to me why. So I've read this book several times simply because. I'm trying to figure out what makes this book so special with and what other books I see people going, oh that that book's just fucking weird. But then they talk about this book as if it's amazing. I don't understand where where the disconnect is when their only argument is it was too weird for me. They didn't like the other book because it was too weird. This book is considerably more weird, I feel. Um, but who knows if you if you are if you are someone who dislikes one weird book and loves another weird book, I'd love to hear why. So that's our question for the day. Uh, not what's your top, what, what's your number twenty through sixteen? Of course, if you want to leave that, leave that down there in the doobly doo. If you have a top twenty list, um, but the question of the day is why do you like one weird thing and you don't like the other weird thing? Uh, I don't think the characters are strong in this. Um, I think that the theme is on point. I think that, but the, the whole reason I like this book is because it somehow became as popular as it did, being the weirdest fucking thing it could possibly be. Flying its freak flag strongly. But until next time, I have been E, you have been you, this has been another Top 5 Friday. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye!